It's my pleasure to introduce Chris Fasti. He is a visiting research scholar in the biology department at Middlebury College in Vermont. He's also an affiliated scientist with the Bonanza Creek Long-Term Ecological Research Site near Fairbanks, Alaska, where he's studied forest response to insect pests, wildfire, floodplain dynamics, and changing climate in elevational and latitudinal tree line. Chris attended the Fine Outreach for Science Gigapan workshop in May 2009. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much. It's good to see all the fans of Prezi.com here. Are you ready for Prezi? In 1948, this man, Walter Bitterlich, an Austrian forester, uh, let me know if you can't hear me because this microphone is not tall enough to do much good, I think. Does it help for me to stand here? Walter Bitterlich published a paper in 1948 in which he demonstrated that if you stand in the woods with your thumb and arm's length and rotate 360 degrees, counting all the trees whose trunks appear to be as large as or larger than your thumb, and then multiply that count, that single number, by a constant, which is just a function of the horizontal angle subtended by your thumb, you can produce an estimate of basal area Stand basal area is a common forestry measure. It is the cross-sectional area of all the trees in the stand expressed per unit area of forest. This works because when you sample, when you select trees this way, uh, any small trees that are included in your sample have to be really close to you. For example, if you choose 1.736 degrees as the horizontal angle subtended by your thumb, then any five centimeter diameter tree that you sample has to be within 1.4 meters of you. That is within a circular plot of radius 1.4 meters. And all of the five centimeter trees in that plot, in that circle, will be included in your sample. All the 10 centimeter trees that you include will have to be within that circle that's 2.9 meters radius. And you will sample all the 10 centimeter trees that are in that circle. The ratio of the cross-sectional area of each of these trees included in your sample and the area of the circular plot that they're sampled in is constant. So that each one of these trees included in the sample contributes this exact same amount to stand basal area. All you have to do is multiply that count by 2.3 in this case to get the basal area in meters squared per hectare. This completely revolutionized forest inventory. Up until this point, in order to know basal area, a forest had to actually measure something. The diameter of all the trees in a plot of known area, so you had to survey out a plot, write down all the numbers, and you still had math homework to do. For the last 60 years, foresters have been able to get estimates of basal area with two or three times orders of magnitude, two or three orders of magnitude more efficiency. This guy is using a prism which displaces the image 1.736 degrees just in order to select which trees are big enough and close enough to be included in the sample. The technique is so simple and so straightforward that it can be done on a photograph. Here's a photograph. It's a gigapan I took in Alaska this summer of a birch forest. In order to do this basal area technique on a digital <coughs> photograph, you need a thumb. You need a digital thumb. And you can have a digital thumb for this photograph because this is a 360 degree panorama. This is what it would look like projected in Google Earth. It would be like a cylinder around the camera. If you look down at the bottom of the cylinder, there's a seam where the right and left margins of the panorama have been joined. 180 degrees across from that seam on the cylinder is the center of the panorama. So you can divide this entire horizontal extent of this panorama into degrees of azimuth from the perspective of the camera. And because we know the horizontal extent of the panorama in pixels, we know how many pixels are in each degree of azimuth. So if we want to know how many pixels are in a 1.736 degree thumb, it, in this, for this panorama, it's 418 pixels. I didn't just take one 
panorama in this birch forest in Alaska. I took three. The Tanana River here is in the distance. And the, between here and there is the Bonanza Creek Long-Term Ecological Research Site near Fairbanks, Alaska. I took three panoramas in this birch forest, 360 degrees each, at the points of a triangle that was 17 meters on a side. And around that triangle, I surveyed out a rectangular plot, 42 by 38 meters, in which I measured the diameter of all the birch trees. So I actually knew the basal area of birch in this forest. Then I made two estimates of basal area using this bitter, bitter lick technique from each of the vertices of the triangle. We'll take a look at one of, one of these other panoramas. It's almost all birch in the canopy. There are a few white spruce in the understory. It's a very simple forest. So at each of the vertices of this triangle, I used the traditional forester's technique with one of these bitter lick prisms to select all the trees that were big enough and close enough and got a basal area estimate that way. And then I took a gigapan at each of these three places. In order to do the basal area technique on the gigapan, I took the full resolution bitmap, put it into Photoshop, or you could use some other program like that. Photoshop has a very handy measuring ruler that measures in pixels. So it's very easy to tell which of the trees are big enough. I didn't have to draw these little rectangles in Photoshop, but this is a screenshot from Photoshop. Tree 63 and 64 are big enough. They're included in the sample. None of the other trees right here are big enough or close enough. There were 11 trees in the whole panorama that were big enough. So 11 is the number for this particular panorama. I did this for all three of the panoramas. And here's the answer. There are three bars here for the three different techniques. On the left is the actual basal area of the trees from the measurement of all the trees. It's about 30 meters squared per hectare. In the middle is the estimate, the average of the estimates of basal area from the tr traditional forester's technique using a prism in the field. And on the right is the average of three estimates made with the equivalent technique on the gigapan image. Uh, I'm going to save for a minute my comments on why the two basal area estimates using the Bitterlick technique are lower than the actual known basal area in the stand. I'll come back to that. I think the main takeaway message of this basal area exercise is that the 60-year-old forester's method is easy, quick, efficient. The equipment is portable, lightweight. Uh, it doesn't take much training. Everything Gigapan is not. So no one in their right mind would set out to estimate basal area using a Gigapan. And the manufacturers of these little prisms that they sell to foresters for 30, 40 bucks a pop need not fear the onslaught of Gigapan. However, if you have a gigapan in the forest taken for other purposes that meets certain criteria, you may be able to derive very good quantitative information from it about that. And it's also possible that historical photos could be used to do this. In order to do the basal area technique, you need to know the horizontal field of view of the photograph. And we almost never know that from old photographic prints. But I just learned this week that there's a, a, a huge collection of 360 degree panoramas taken in the 1930s, uh, some of which are in forest and the location of these is known. So it may very well be possible to use this as an application to apply to old photos where we don't know anything about what the forest inventory condition was back then. Having demonstrated that we can know with some precision the azimuth from the perspective of the camera to anything in a gigapan, for instance, each of these trees. If we also know the distance between the camera and each tree, we can make a map of the trees. And it might become clear to you why there are these tags on the trees uh, of a known horizontal dimension. And that can be used to determine the distance between the tree and the camera. In fact, I don't even need to know the distance between the camera and the tree to map a lot of these trees because I have three cameras. So I can triangulate the position of a lot of these trees. So here's the setup, 17 meter on a side equilateral triangle. I can project a ray in the azimuth toward each of the trees. Here I projected just 29 rays from two of the cameras. These are the rays to the 29 trees 
which can be seen from all three cameras. I've only used two of the cameras here because you only need two to triangulate. So let's do that. So there are 29 trees mapped just where their respective rays overlapped, across, intersected. Now, because we have a third camera, we can check our work. And let's do that for just five of these trees. There are the five rays from two of the cameras. We'll project the five, same five rays from the third camera. And we do pretty well in four of these cases down at the bottom. Uh, not as good as it looks here because uh, these black circles are 75 centimeters uh, in diameter. So we generally seem to be mapping these trees within 10 or 30, 10 or 20 or 30 centimeters from where they are, which is within the footprint of the tree trunk in the forest. It's not bad. The one at the top we missed. So we're not sure where that tree is. And that's probably because the red and the green ray are close to parallel. And the triangulation then becomes very sensitive to error. And two really important errors here are uh, surveying out the positions of your three cameras. Any surveyor knows to triangulate something, you really have to know where you are. And also, these trees aren't particularly vertical. They lean so that uh, if you're sighting to one tree from two different cameras, you have to know the height. You have to sight at the same height above the ground. And I didn't measure the height. But both of these sources of error can be controlled. So we can do even better than I did here, I think. And in this case, with the, when you miss, if you have a choice of pairs of rays, you just have a rule that you choose that pair which meets closest to 90 degrees. So there are 29 trees mapped with information from three gigapans. And uh, we now have 60 more trees here that I could see from two of the cameras. And we can triangulate those too. We just can't check our work. So there we go. Now there are an additional 60 trees, which I could only see from one camera. You can't triangulate them, and that's when we need the tags. Because I know that these are 16.5 centimeters across, we can derive the distance between the camera and the tree. Because there are four things which determine how big an object appears to be in a photographic image how big the object is, how far the object is from the camera, the focal length of the lens used, and how big you display the image. And those four things are related in a, a very straightforward way. D is the size of the object, R is the distance to the object, F is the focal length of the lens, A prime is the actual size of the image projected onto the sensor of the camera. The pink and the blue triangles are similar triangles, so the ratio of their equivalent sides is constant. So if you know any three of these things, you can derive the fourth variable. Let's do it. This is a gigapan uploaded to gigapan.org this summer by Mark Buma in the Netherlands. It's of the public square in front of Speyer Cathedral in Speyer, Germany. And Mark Buma was nice enough to send me the, the full resolution image of this so I can do this analysis. There are a couple of, I thought it would be great to see if we could map these stone pylons that are arrayed across this plaza. And uh, because of a few characteristics of this gigapan, we can do this. One, this gigapan is a 360 degree gigapan. Second, it's a high resolution gigapan, 1.6 gigapixels. So there's a lot of information in there. We can do this with some precision. It was stitched with gigapan stitch. So we know that radial distortion of each individual image was removed before it was stitched. And we know that the edges were cropped, so it's exactly 360 degrees. It was uploaded with Gigapan, with Gigapan stitch so that uh, we know the focal length of the lens in the stitch notes, and we know the make and model of the camera so we can know the specifications of the sensor. We have to figure out D, the size of the object, these pylons. And if I had taken this Gigapan myself, I would have measured it if I was trying to make a map. But Mark Buma turned me on to this. These construction fences used in Europe, he says, are two meters tall. And there are several of these pylons lined up right along the fence. So I determined that 98 centimeters is D. It's, I'm just using the dimension of the pylon from the top of the basal molding to the top of the pylon. And it should be the same for all the pylons. For A prime, we know the dimensions of the, pick of the sensor. So all we have to do is translate a pixel measurement of the dimension we're interested in into the actual measurement 
uh, which was the actual size of that image on the sensor when the camera was taken, when the picture was taken. And for this particular pylon, it's 0.883 millimeters. We have to do this for individually for each of the pylons. And then we have everything we need. So let's do the whole process to determine the azimuth of each of the 19 pylons that we can see. Start at the left side of the panorama, measure pixels across, translate that into degrees of azimuth, and we'll light the pylon up as we go across, and then light up the ray. Then we apply our measurement to each of the pylons, and then we'll plot that along the respective ray for that pylon. And of course, the public square is square. <laughs> As you can see from this aerial view, that's Spire Cathedral, and in the lower left is the square. You can imagine how amazed I was when I first saw this. This is distorted on this monitor here, but it's really square. <laughs> and this is straight out of Excel. You know, this is just a, an XY plot of the you know, results of the trigonometric functions that you use the raw data. Um, so it works you can map stuff fairly well from an individual gigapan if it meets certain criteria. And we need to start a conversation about what we might want to do with this. You know, there, there are lots of reasons you might want a simple map of something in your gigapan. For now, what I have to do with it is map the remaining 60 trees here that I couldn't triangulate. So we just apply this technique, and there we go. We've got 150 trees mapped just from information that was in three gigapans. Now you might notice something about this map, especially where the cameras are, especially the upper two cameras. They appear to be in areas where there aren't many trees. That's real. Those cameras are in little gaps. I put those cameras there because I had needed some elbow room to do all this stuff there. And that's why our estimates of basal area from the three points of the triangle was low, were lower than the actual basal area that we measured here. So this isn't an, that wasn't an error of the basal area estimation technique. That was an operator error. That's a good example of where not to, how not to sample your sites for drawing this kind of estimate. So I think the main tech home messages from this mapping exercise are one, that it works. Uh, you can do this. You know, this is, this is something that, um, that there, there's enough data in these gigapans to make pretty good maps. And secondly, I didn't use um, uh, proprietary image analysis software. I didn't, didn't even use GIS to do this. The only, the only thing I used to do this analysis so far is Photoshop and Excel. So you really can do this. This is not robot science. This is very straightforward stuff. Um, so please let me know if you have any ideas about what to do with this. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. But I did ask myself the question you know, of, of all the people I've seen depicted in gigapans, for which of them would I most like to know the answer to the question, where has she been? And so I give you Miss Pixie, who appears 15 times in this classic gigapan from back in 2009, taken by the gigapanographer currently known as Kilgore 661, <laughs> who was kind enough to give me this image. And I thank some people here in the, in the lab for letting me get this, uh, this bitmap. Now, in order to map Miss Pixie's 15 locations, we need to know D. We need to know a dimension. And you can imagine the intellectual energies I spent trying to figure out which dimension of Miss Pixie to use for this. This pose suggested that maybe I could use interocular distance. And God bless the internet. You know, Google Scholar leads me. This is a 1921 paper with the frequency distribution of interocular distances for 50 women in the United Kingdom. Perfect, right? But. I did better. <laughs> Miss Pixie is a professional model, and she has a very professional website. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine how much this slowed down the analysis. <laughs> but there's her height. You know, I don't know whether to believe that or not, but in all these cases, you know, we can make a map using this number, and it may be scaled a little bit wrong, but that's all we really need to do this. We can make 
Here's the XY plot right out of Excel of Miss Pixie's 15 locations with Kilgore 661 at the origin where he belongs, where the, where the gigapan was standing. Now this isn't nearly as satisfying as the nice square from Spire Cathedral, so we need another way of confirming this. Here is Bath, UK, where this was taken. That's the Avon River wrapping around downtown Bath. And I've georeferenced the Excel chart over the cross Bath where this was taken. So there's where Miss Pixie was, and I've used the simple drawing tools in Google Earth to put little two meter tall pylons where Miss Pixie was standing. The blue water, this thing that looks like a swimming pool, is one of the hot springs. That's why it's called Bath. So let's enter the panorama. Now there are four Miss Pixies, and we can increase the transparency of the image so we can see what's behind it and see the pylons. And let's go all the way. That's the Excel chart. It is pasted onto the terrain model in Google Earth. So it's, it's glued down to the Earth surface in Google Earth. And those green pylons are sitting, the two meter tall green pylons are sitting on that terrain model surface. So Miss Pixie is standing right, you know, about where she should be. Here she is in good shape, standing right on a red dot almost. Now here it appears that Miss Pixie is a little bit on the other side of the red dot, like I mapped her too close, but I don't think I did. I think the map is pretty good. She's just up in the air. Put a couple other of these. This one, uh, she's standing in the right, but looks like I might have missed the azimuth. I may have measured pixels wrong. I didn't go back to check why, why there's that error. Um, I, I may have just made a mistake counting. I can't imagine what would have distracted me, though. And here, her feet are way below the red dot where she should be standing. Here, her feet are below the red dot. I think this discrepancy is because of the discrepancy between the Google Earth terrain surface. I don't have quite enough room to mouse here. I'll, I'll catch up in a minute. So there's a discrepancy between the Google Earth terrain surface and the actual surface that Miss Pixie was standing on. And you would expect them, them not to be perfectly lined up there. So we can turn off the terrain model and now the Google, the Excel chart is simply at flat and level at some average elevation so that now if we believe our two dimensional map the difference between Miss Pixie's, Miss Pixie's feet and the chart is topographic information. So we can actually extend this into three dimensions. Obviously this is not the way to make a topographic map. <laughs> but there is three dimensional there's, there's good um, two-dimensional and potential three-dimensional information just in the gigapans. So I, I hope uh, that we can, this is just a start of a conversation about how we might use gigapan information for, for spatial needs. And imagine what a great student project this would make, a cross-disciplinary cross project in which they take a gigapan. Now think of what I had to go through, the photography, uh, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, uh, geography, cartography, soft porn. Yeah, <laughs> you can take it as far as you want. I think the students will really love this. Thank you very much. <laughs>
if you've got vertical trees or poles and shadows, you know, hard shadows, you could use photogrammetry to measure angles. Um, really? If you've got a tree and shadow? Oh, you know, if you, if you have a 180 degree photograph, then if you have poles in the ground or trees in the ground, right. you can look at the direction of the shadows. Right. Right, so shadows on both sides of a 180. Yeah. Uh -huh. so cool. I imagine they could be extended. That's great. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Thank you.